Okay, recording started. Let me just make sure. Okay. Um, all right. So um, we've got an exam on Tuesday. I have uh, posted a preview. I just updated it. So if you've already downloaded it and started working on it, all I did is, is add the little gray code uh, derivation. Okay, uh, homework five, is it eight or two, the modulation for number two? Okay, I'll need to look that up. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I went through the example of how to derive a gray code for uh, three digits or four digits and that type of thing. So I included that in the uh, exam preview. Uh, it's, kind of an easy question to ask. So, uh, all right. So, yes, there was a question on this assignment here. Um, maybe did I understand that? Um, question we have a question about homework five is it eight or two the modulation number for number two okay using your pan modulator and demodulator uh okay so yeah we did both a two and an and an eight didn't we um so let's see uh, first of all i think uh looked like a bunch of people have already turned it in so if you've chose one or the other uh that's okay and just go ahead and document which one you choose it's just a matter of um you know being able to uh, 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 work with the actual um you know formulas in matlab so um i think that we can if you want to make it interesting choose uh choose the eight Pam, uh, just uh, just to make it easier, uh, but uh, whichever one, just document that's the one you uh, you chose. Whether it's a, a, a m equals two or m equals eight, Pam. Sorry, that wasn't uh, entirely clear, was it? So, uh, and again, if you've already turned your assignment in, don't worry, I'll I'll figure that out. Uh, I did want to uh, let's see, let's. Let's go ahead and um, look at the, uh, let me share my uh, screens here. And uh, so if we look at this <clears throat> lecture here, um, so our next test is Tuesday, 3-5, grades are due uh, three seven for midterms, midterm grades, of course. So I will try to get uh, the exam graded and the uh, uh, assignment homework five that's due, I think, tonight. And if you have turned in assignments a little bit late, um, you know, I will go back and catch those up, right? So uh, if you, you know, turned in, uh, you know, let's say assignment three, uh, a few days late after I'd started grading, then uh, that's great. I'm glad you are persevering on it and turning it in, even though it's late. Uh, I have not gone back. I've been focused on trying to keep uh, as current as possible, uh, but I will do that before turning in uh, the midterm grades on Thursday. So, if you are behind on your assignments, please, please, please get those turned in, right? So, I mean, midterm grades are there to kind of help you know how you're doing in the course. Um, hopefully, you do know that. If you are uh, concerned about your progress in this course, uh, then you should be making uh, an effort to meet me in my virtual office hours. And if you cannot make the ones on Tuesday mornings before lecture, then please make an appointment 
and the uh, means to do that are uh, posted at the uh, first part of the Moodle page. And uh, if, if barring that, just send me an email or a text or, or something to say, hey, I, I need help. I do not want um, you know, a situation where we're trying to help you pass this course and graduate. Uh, this is a required course for double E's. And you know, we don't want to be worrying about that in the last couple of weeks of the semester. Uh, we want to take care of that uh, earlier. So, um, all right. So uh, let's look at the uh, some MATLAB things here, right? So um, an essential skill in modeling or simulations, right? This is essentially what we're doing with the uh, the MATLAB efforts that we're doing um, is, is evaluating the results, right? So one of the dangers in modeling is we have to make some simplifying assumptions to make things work, right? To make things tractable in our modeling. Of course, you know, as we get uh, spend more time, more resources, more money, um, on our models, we can get them to be more or more accurate. But the reason why we model something is that we want to be able to predict its results before we go to all the work of actually building and implementing the system, right? So these days, a lot of systems are uh, encoded in um, uh, micro uh, electronics, right? And so you might need to go and make a uh, uh, a photo mass set to actually build a custom chipset to do this. Well, that costs hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to do typically. And so uh, we model to try to uh, make sure we understand that the thing's going to work and we can characterize this performance. We can uh, demonstrate to our stakeholders that, yes, this new version is better than the old version, right? And in some ways, right? But when we are doing these models, we're making a lot of simplifying assumptions, right? And so um, as, as we're doing it, we're only including in this last go around AWGN noise, right? There's lots of other impairments that can happen, but uh, we do want to look at our results and do, you know, what we might call a sanity check, right? So we want to look at these, um, results and make sure that they make sense, right? Because we don't want to blindly trust our models. Our models might be just too naive to uh, give us the predictive power that we want, or we might have made a mistake, right? So um, in this case, you know, I saw So. Professor, you muted yourself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. All I did was plug in my power and uh, somehow I, I muted myself. All right. So uh, where are we? Let's... Um, Okay, so um, we uh, so we want to evaluate our results, and uh, I'm not exactly sure where you uh, lost the the sound, but we want to look at the results and see if they make sense, right? And based upon what we expect, so we need to think a little bit about the problem and what we expect the results to be. Right. And so this is part of, you know, developing these critical reasoning skills that uh, we talk about so much. Employers are uh, always talking about how they want uh, uh, graduates or, or candidates to have good critical reasoning skills. Well, this is one of those situations, right, is assessing 
the conclusions that you're coming up with. And here's this example, right? So you're asked to modulate uh, an 8 PSK and show the constellation. So how many constellation clusters should you see? Boy, my spelling is terrible. Um, you should see eight, right? And uh, a, a few of you all ended up with just two, right? And the, the reason behind that is a mismatch in how you generated the input data and what you specified in the modulator, right? So if you look at the documentation, the modulator, um, let's say a, a QAM or, or PSK modulator, can uh, accept integer data or bit data, right? And if you're, let's say, an M equals eight uh, or an eight PSK, uh, then, uh, you know, M is equal to eight. And so your uh, symbol values could range from zero to seven, right? And, and minus one, basically, zero to seven. But in, in binary data, that would be three bits per symbol, right? And it would be zero, zero, zero to all the way up to one, 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 right? In terms of bits. But the uh, modulator needs to know which one to, you know, how to interpret the data coming in. And, um, you know, if you do it one way, it'll recognize that there's an error. But if you create your data as binary data and you do your rand i random integer and you set the range from zero to one, that would give you binary data, right? And then if you just use the defaults on the PSK modulator, then it will, um, it will assume that you have integer data. And there's nothing wrong with integer data coming in at, at between zero and one, even though it could accept up to zero to seven, right? So uh, when you look at it, you should see eight constellations. If you see two, that should kind of help you understand that something might be amiss. Right. Uh, same thing for the uh, QAM. Uh, some people ended up with uh, not resetting their M value and they had just done the kind of ideal non noisy 8 PSK and forgot to reset M to 64 from uh, 8. And you generated an 8 QAM instead of a 64 QAM, right? So you should look at the constellation and see that something's amiss. Another way of kind of helping you is instead of just doing like an FPrintf, number of errors, blah, 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 um, go ahead and uh, encode the parameters that you're expecting, right? Number of errors for and plug in like M. QAM, right? So that way, if you uh, accidentally left this at eight or something, then you would see, oh, that's eight, eight QAM, wait, or or the SNR is uh, 12 versus 20 or, or something like that. Um, so uh, what, uh, I, I'm going to show you some, uh, my take on this uh, problem here in a minute, but let's, let's then kind of step back and say, all right, now, what do you learn from this, right? I didn't explicitly ask you to write up anything in terms of the observation. I think I uh, asked for a little bit of feedback, but I didn't ask you to go that deep. But, you know, yeah, uh, what do you learn out of this exercise, right? Well, uh, a few things, so, you know, you must match the symbol order and that's that gray versus binary. And there was a little bit of confusion on that because the default ends up being gray order and stuff. But, um, you know, yeah, we our transmitter and receiver must agree on the symbol ordering, right? And it's, you can choose uh, 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 binary ordering, or you can choose gray code ordering, or as it turns out, you can create your own. And like in a standard, a Wi-Fi standard or an LTE standard or, or 5G standard, that type of thing, that 
type of symbol ordering may be specified, right? Is very likely going to be specified because even in gray coding, there can be some um, some uh, arbitrariness on how it, the code is actually applied to a constellation, right? And so um, these things need to be specified, and the receiver must agree with the transmitter, or you're going to get crazy number of errors, right? So that's one conclusion. Uh, error rates are dependent upon getting the SNR, the signal noise ratio, implemented correctly. So you want to set both the modulator and demodulator for unit average power, for example, in, in the case of uh, a QAM where the energy of each constellation point might be different depending upon which kind of ring it's in. Um, uh, but if you uh, set both of your units, it's a little bit of a, a quirk of where we're at with this and that uh, we're not implementing uh, some sophistication in our receiver that would be able to kind of calibrate the amplitude levels, right? And so um, uh, you can specify unit average power for both the modulator and the demodulator and you'll get uh accurate results or and or you can specify measured when calling uh the awgn function and that way as i think i chatted a little bit about on tuesday that uh this function will then measure the power the average power of the input signal, and then synthesize noise uh, according to the specified signal noise ratio and that measured power, right? So it can calculate out what uh, exactly how much noise to add. So, uh, and then we can re, uh, relate to EBNO using K if necessary. I don't think that was necessary in this case, but uh, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about this uh, in a few slides. Um, and also just noting that sample rate will affect this. Uh, that uh, not anything we worked with on this example, but if you were uh, uh, doing things and you're, let's say, uh, you moved on from MATLAB into Simulink, and you're actually uh, including a sample rate in Simulink. I know it's beyond our scope right now, but um, you're, you would find that uh, you've got to be aware of the sample rate when calculating EBNO or SNR and that type of thing, right? So, uh, but here's kind of the, the bottom line conclusion. Uh, the error rate worsens with decreasing distance, right? So now these aren't directly comparable, uh, but if you went in and, and looked at for the same amount of average energy or, or signal power that you're emitting, uh, if you uh, looked at the distance, I think I'm pretty sure these are the results you should get, right? And so uh, how much of that makes sense? Well, uh, certainly, the error rate for an 8PSK at 20 dB signal noise ratio should be less than the error rate for a 12 dB. And also for uh, 64 qualm, 20 dB error rate should be less than that for a worse signal noise ratio at 12 dB, right? So, uh, lower dB for this SNR means you're either or. Uh, or both, that your signal is lower and or your noise is higher, right, to get a lower ratio. Both of those, either of those, would cause an error rate to worsen. So, um, right, so let's take a look at, uh, let's see if I can still have my remotely session uh, active and... Um, Let's see, can I get it up here without disconnecting? So um, here I, uh, you know, is, is an example, I think, of a, uh, what, what I like to do on these uh, type of programming task or whatever, right? So uh, I start off with some, oops, some 
titling information, put myself in there. Maybe if I uh, really want to, I'll reserve my rights uh, with a copyright statement, uh, whatever, right? But then I always put this close all clear and clear console here, right? So the close all just closes all your open figures and other type of uh, windows, right? Clear is the important one and that clears our workspace of any leftover variables. Uh, the reason why this is important is sometimes you will uh, do some uh, work uh, kind of ad hoc in a commando, uh, command window right here and um, you'll have some variables left over in your workspace. And then when you run it, well, it'll, uh, if you reference that variable in your script, it'll, it'll work, right? But when I run your code, I haven't done anything in this command window, right? I take your M code and I, I run it. And sometimes there are some errors. Um, but if you do this clear and you make sure that any stray variables are uh, are are handled right they're they're cleared and then if you run it and you get an error you know that oh I need to actually declare and assign that variable in my code right so uh, here and this is not the only way of doing this assignment this is just I think uh, a, a good way, right? So I go ahead and declare an M and I'm gonna uh, you know, say that that's QAM. Instead of just using a generic M, I'm gonna uh, uh, declare it to be QAM. Not essentially uh, necessary, but it's uh, just kind of handy. Then I calculate K from that log base to a M, right? Then I set up this N. I I think I asked for 10,000, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, in my case, I'm uh, calculating binary or bit data, right? Instead of uh, integer data. You could do the integer all the way, just be consistent, right? So if I'm doing bit data, binary data, then I will, um, it's helpful to scale my n by the number of k per bit so that this ends up being an integer number of uh, these uh, Ks, right? So um, 10,000 isn't necessarily an integer uh, factor of, uh, or, or uh, multiple of 64, and your modular will complain in that case, right? So, um, uh, and then I uh, do this in array form so that I'm creating a vector instead of a a square array, which is kind of annoying in MATLAB, but um, all right, so now I have my input data. Now I modulate it and I'm gonna go ahead and, and yeah, even though gray is default, I like to be clear on things, right? To myself and anyone else that reads the code. Not necessary, just kind of good, right? And I'm going to now override the default by saying that my input type is bit, so it interprets it correctly. And I'm going to go ahead and set unit average power to true, right? So that's going to scale the amplitude of this uh, uh, signal so that the overall, if you average up all 64 constellation points, that uh, that average power is going to be 1, right? So uh, then I set my SNR to 20. I then uh, add AWGN. I don't have to specify measured here because it's going to assume that I have unit average power and I've specified it that way, right? So if I don't specify measured or any other thing here, it's going to assume that this thing has unit average power and uh, calculate the noise accordingly and add it to it, right? Then I can demodulate it, right? I need to demodulate it. And again, I'm going to specify these things uh, uh, explicitly, right? And uh, then I'm going to print out my number of errors. And again, as I showed in the uh, presentation and the slide deck, I'm going to uh, pass in 
this uh, M value and the SNR value, and then, yeah, I, I calculate, you could calculate this as a separate line, but um, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I, I just chose to calculate it in line there. And then I'm going to create a, a scatter plot and a title. A little quirk of um, uh, MATLAB here on uh, plots, if you, uh, you know, are adding a title, you can just kind of put a comma and continue all this on the same line. If I really wanted to be good, I could uh, use, uh, you know, a version of printf that would uh, write out uh, the title with these as variables to a string and then uh, pass a string into the title command here. Then I'm going to, um, uh, change my SNR to 12, do the same thing over again. I don't have to recalculate the trans transmitted signal, but I do need to add the noise and then demodulate it and, and so on, right? So now I, I can just copy and paste. There's a few of you did this in a loop, and that's great. Um, then you, you just need to make sure that, I know it's a little bit awkward, I said, hey, do this uh, uh, QAM and, and PSK for 12 dB and then do, redo it all for 20, right? But uh, however, whatever order you do things in, you need to make sure that you are setting your parameters accordingly, right? So now I, I uh, set up my PSK, uh, my uh, M for the PSK is eight. And now I need to uh, regenerate my data uh, with the right number of um, uh, uh, factors here. Maybe it's not essential. You just need to keep track of that. The I data here uh, is consistent with this I data that you're uh, you're comparing against. A uh, few of y'all ended up with some kind of mismatches of uh, not realizing you overwrote uh, I data. So again, same thing. Um, oops, let's go down to the PSK. Now the PSK is uh, for an eight, eight PSK is uh, just gonna have one ring. So it's gonna be a unit average power uh, to begin with, right? So all those constellation points all have the same energy because they're all the same distance from the origin. And I do that, so blah, 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 let's just run this, and uh, we see here that, um, let me move things around, and so, wow, got it, oh, gosh, so, um, what we see here is a 64 qualm with 20 dB of signal noise ratio. And that's a lot more power than um, uh, signal power than noise power, right? But you still see here that, wow, this is a little bit messy and we might expect some errors, right? You, you can look at this, it's like, wow, do those uh, constellation points that are maybe right here in this decision boundary, are they really associated with this one or that one? It, it looks difficult to figure out, right? So we expect to have some errors, but it's probably still almost usable, right? And uh, But then when we go down to 12 dB SNR, it's a mess, right? So uh, yeah, I, I can't even see kind of the boundaries between symbols, right? So this I expect to have quite a few errors, right? And uh, very difficult to figure out. Uh, then when we look at the uh, PSK version, well, there's only eight symbols, first of all. And yeah, it's not uh, trivial to compare a QAM with a PSK, but uh, the big deal is that there's only eight symbols. And so the distance between these constellation points are a lot. And we, when we look at this, so it's like, wow, that's really easy. I would draw these uh, decision boundaries as kind of radials that are right uh, in between 
the constellation points, right? And it doesn't look like there's any problems at all. I look at this one, it's kind of like this. It's like, yeah, there's going to be some areas where we're going to make some mistakes, right? So uh, let's look at our results. So uh, with the 64 qualm, with 20 dBs and R, yeah, we had 497. That's, you know, uh, out of 10,000 times 64 bits, um, that's not too bad, right? But here we got in that messy one with uh, only the 12 dBs and R, we've got 6,700 uh, some odd uh, bits. So that's a lot. Uh, with the 20 dB 8 PSK, we saw that that one's very clean. So yeah, we got zero errors. Now, uh, then uh, for the messier one, we got uh, 319, which is kind of on the same order of magnitude as, as the 64 qualm at 20 dB. But uh, when we looked at those uh, uh, results, yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? So uh, look at your results. Think about what do you expect? Does it make sense, right? That's what an engineer does. They don't just uh, crank out the um, uh, the data and hope that it's all accurate, all right? So uh, that's, I think, uh, what I wanted to talk about on that. Uh, let's, let's look at uh, then... Compare that. So yes, uh, in this case, we ended up with these conclusions here and stuff. So I hope all that makes sense. Now, um, one thing that I thought um, merits some attention is a little bit of discussion between this EBNO and the SNR. Uh, we use both of these terms at different times. And we should understand how they relate to each other, right? So we oftentimes use this EBNO or the energy per bit to the power spectral density of noise is often used to compare modulation techniques, right? And then uh, we can compare uh, an 8-qualm to a 64-qualm to a PSK to other sophisticated uh, type of things. And this is really the metric that we're going to trade off. If you look at some uh, comparative plots, they're typically going to be in this EBNO because really what are we trying to transmit? We're trying to transmit information, right? And uh, this uh, uh, energy per bit is not exactly the uh, energy required to transmit a little unit of information from a, uh, like a Shannon uh, entropy thing uh, uh, concept, but it's very close, right? So, um, uh, but the signal noise ratio metric is like, if I'm implementing it, I'm working at the circuit level or uh, system level, and I'm trying to figure out what kind of noise figure I need for my uh, first stage uh, amplifier in my receiver, what we call a noise, low noise amplifier, an LNA, then I'm typically working with signal noise ratio. So how do they relate to each other? Recall that this NO here in this EBNO is a power spectral density, right? Meaning that uh, that's the amount of energy per hertz, right? It's a density. So, um, you know, just like a, uh, uh, density of a material is maybe grams per uh, cubic um, uh, liter or per cubic uh, centimeter or, or liter or something like that, right? So um, here it's uh, in terms of frequency, right? So that means we need to account for frequency somehow, right? So note that EB is an energy, not a power. Right, so this S and the signal, that's the, the power. And that noise here, that's the total power, not a, not a density. So we've got both a, a density and energy versus power type of thing to deal with. Now, to be precise, when we start relating these, we'll typically talk about a carrier to noise ratio or a C over N. 
uh, which is directly relatable to the signal noise ratio, but it makes sure that we're talking about it at the RF level, not like at a, a baseband level. So this curator noise can be considered this SNR, um, uh, but you know, definitely specifically saying that we're talking about it at the carrier level or the, the RF signal that's actually going out on a channel. All right, so uh, here's actually how we're going to relate that. So our carrier to noise here is this energy uh, per bit divided by the NO. Re recall that we, we tend to write this as uh, EBNO, but it's really a ratio, just like SNR is a ratio. Uh, the R stands for the ratio there, but uh, this is just implied that it's EB divided by NO. Uh, so, um, now, then we scale it here, where B is the channel bandwidth, and FB is the channel data rate, okay? Now, uh, we can relate this uh, to maybe the energy per symbol through the uh, K factor or the log base two of M, right? Uh, uh, we did that on the first exam where we looked at the number of uh, uh, bits versus the number of symbols based upon M. Uh, therefore, we can substitute in some stuff here now. Um, we can write this energy per uh, symbol uh, divided by the power spectrum density is this carrier to noise ratio or SNR times the bandwidth of our channel divided by the symbol rate, okay? Uh, FS is the symbol rate. So this FB is in terms of the number of bits. Yeah, we call it the channel data rate. Uh, I'm not sure if I was in charge, if I would have chosen that terminology, but um, uh, that's distinguished from this F of S, which is the symbol rate, right? And that's related through this uh, K factor or log base uh, two of M. So, um, you know, one, your, your assignment right now, you're using MATLAB to plug in uh, to the Q function and figure out and uh, error rate, uh, that type of thing, right? So, um, you, uh, you know, if I would ask you to uh, a question on the exam and I would give you an SNR or an EBNO, you ought to be able to, uh, you know, translate between those, get it in the right form to actually plug into uh, the right formulas to then go to the Q table and come up with the result, right? So, all right. Um, so we talked about uh, the gray code on Tuesday and uh, so I've included this basically in the exam preview. Um, and so that's pretty straightforward. Practice this a couple of times. Uh, maybe I ask, you know, give you uh, a, a K is equal to two code here, and then ask you to generate a K is equal to three code, right? And so, um, you know, again, there could be some uh, arbitrariness associated with this. You know, one could start with one one, and then your next one would be one zero, and then zero zero, and zero one, and stuff. So, uh, gray codes aren't completely unique, uh, but yeah, if I give you this, you ought to be able to generate the corresponding k is equal to three version of that. And then, yeah, this one is a little bit complex to assign. You kind of need to think about, all right, let's start at this one and, and assign this to zero, zero. And yeah, we've got to make sure that this these two are gray code compatible, This these two are gray code compatible, and these two are gray code compatible, right? So you see that each of those only change one bit, right? These are uh, the, the closest ones. Actually, I think these two are the closest ones. These are um, a little bit closer than that distance there. Um, so um, uh, so maybe th this one requires a little bit of 
thinking uh, to get things assigned right, but uh, if you go through it, it, it ultimately makes sense. Um, all right, so there's a couple of uh, examples here. What I did is I, uh, last year, instead of doing MATLAB work, we did mostly uh, problems, right? Kind of traditional old uh, problems. And uh, this year, instead of doing textbook problems, we're doing um, um, MATLAB problems. But it's hard to test you on MATLAB. So uh, I'm giving you the solution to three problems that I uh, assigned last year. Right, and so you can go through these. Uh, I'm gonna hopefully come back to this at the end of the lecture, but I want to get to some other content first. So, um, if uh, I've uploaded that document to Moodle, right, and then these next few slides kind of walk through how to do that, but. Uh, I want to include some uh, new content and bring us to a conceptual conclusion here in a few minutes. So last lecture, we talked about there's uh, a couple of, uh, well, we talked about three different types of receivers. Uh, two were correlation type receivers and uh, there was a little bit of kind of rearrangement of those. Uh, you can go back and, and look at that. But they're both on this uh, same concept of correlating the uh, uh, received signal with, in the general case, the, the basis functions to create vectors from the signals, right? So we receive a, a signal, now we want to convert that to a vector. So we uh, multiply by the um, uh, basis function, integrate that, and then, then we uh, correlate that with each of our ideal symbols, right? And our ideal symbols, uh, uh, and then we uh, run that through a threshold detector. And the received uh, signal will match best to the uh, signal, uh, the symbol that corresponds to the one that was transmitted, right? So at the receiver, we don't know which one was transmitted. So we um, uh, correlate uh, the received signal vector in the vector version uh, with each of our different symbols. And we see which one matches the best, right? And that's going to provide that maximum threshold. And we're going to say that that's most likely our best estimate of uh, what was actually sent, right? And then we talked about how we can also do that with this match filter, right? And we said that they're equivalent. Uh, there uh, is a... Uh, implicit assumption there or it's actually explicit in that we're looking at this time t equals capital t right so uh to build up an understanding of that let's look at uh the difference between correlation and convolution they're very very similar uh but it's helpful to uh really you know, kind of point out the differences, right? So here, this would be a cross correlation of a stochastic or random uh, process, random variables here. And uh, we have this X of T, maybe that's the R of T that we receive, and Y of T uh, would be the, um, uh, maybe the, the, the symbol that we're uh, comparing to. And the, this cross-correlation is equal to the expected value of these multiplied by each other, but with this parameter tau. Note that the t here, they're both 
positive, right? And it's the tau that's the negative, right? So we're uh, subbing in this parameter uh, uh, tau, right? So there's uh, an assumption that we're whites and stationary here because we're only looking at this difference instead of any absolute time t, right? But uh, then if we look at tau equals zero, then that's a cross correlation at tau is equal to zero and that tau basically goes away, right? Now we have this expected value of uh, the two random variables, right? And uh, so we can uh, uh, evaluate this by integrating from minus infinity to infinity of these two uh, variables times each other, right? So uh, there we go. Now, let's compare this to convolution just in a general sense now. We have uh, x of tau times y of t minus tau d tau, right? Tau is our dummy variable in this case, and we're trying to uh, get this in terms of t, z uh, of t. Note that now this tau here is positive, but this tau over here is negative, right? And so uh, essentially y is being flipped in the time domain, right? Um, maybe you, hopefully this uh, sparked some memories from uh, last year's signal and systems class. I'm sure you did lots of convolution in that class. And so uh, we recognize that convolution here has uh, this where it's flipped in time or mirrored in time. So they look very close to each other uh, with that little kind of subtle distinction there, All right? So uh, they're related, but not, not exactly the same. Now let's look at this, right? So let's take this R of T and uh, uh, multiply it and integrate it. Uh, so we're basically cross correlating uh, we're going to start at time zero and go up to time t, right? We're going to sample the output of this at every t seconds, right? And then we're going to reset this uh, integral uh, every time, right? So uh, we're just calculating from zero to t. Now let's look down here. This is our match filter version. So let's write out that equation. We're going to integrate from uh, zero to, well, this is a lowercase t here, right? So we're gonna start at time zero, but uh, this uh, function here, this output uh, is uh, going to continue on, right? So we're gonna start con calculating at zero. Uh, we're gonna integrate to t, uh, where t just, continues to advance. And uh, of course we're using this dummy variable tau, uh, but we're interested in what happens at the sampling instant of capital T, right? So let's, let's sub in what we learned, uh, what we defined our matched filter as, right? This isn't an arbitrary filter. This is what we call this match filter. And it's, um, equal to the mirror image of the symbol, right? Uh, uh, where that symbol is defined over some period uh, of time t. And so we uh, plug that in here, and this is our uh, uh, output of this, right? So this this uh, impulse response H of T is, is convolving with this R of T. Now, uh, so this uh, H of T here, this T minus tau is equal to this uh, S of T minus little t plus tau. And we plug that in now at, uh, uh, um, so I'll make sure that there's, there's some, uh, subtleties here, right? So if you, uh, uh, plug in this data, uh, correctly here, this is, uh, 
capital T minus this lowercase t. So um, this tau becomes a positive here because of this minus uh, t right there, right? So um, now let's look at this at a little t equals our sampling instant, our, our capital T. And so now we're just integrating from zero to T and we're going to look at that result. And so if we plug in T equals capital T, then these two T's, this T cancels out with this T equals T there and we're just left with tau. So let's compare these. That is the same as that. Remember this tau is just a dummy variable. Right, t is just a uh, you know dummy variable there in the integration, right? And so uh, these have the exact same form, but at this time t equals capital T. I want to show this graphically now, and let's assume that we have a uh, uh, symbol set that is either plus uh, a divided by square root of L, where L is this distance uh, uh, here and in, in time, right? In this, and, and this is a sample time domain system. So, um, and so we're either going to be a minus that or a plus that, right? And it's kind of a rectangular type of thing where uh, now our, uh, H of uh, this can be uh, written as this, right? So this would be our match filter. Uh, it technically flipped in time, but uh, it's symmetrical, so that doesn't really matter, right? So uh, TS is your sampling time, and uh, T capital M here is then the length of your overall um uh, system, right? So uh, the number of uh, uh, these these uh, sampling uh, instances, right? So um, now let's do a match filter output. So here, this is going to be convolved with this, right? So again, remembering back to when we first learned about convolution, you probably convolved a rectangular with a rectangle, right? And you end up with a triangle, right? So as you slide this guy across this, uh, well, this is positive, this is negative. So you're, um, you're going to get a progressively more and more negative value until they're both overlapping perfectly, right? And then you will have a, um, uh, a negative maximum value, right? Where where this guy is overlapped completely with that, right? And you're you're summing up uh, all the area under that curve, and then uh, as it continues to slide across, now you're going to have let's say three negative impulses with a one positive impulse, right? So now it's going to start decreasing. Uh, as you slide some more, you're going to have two negatives and two positives. Those are going to cancel out. You'll have a zero. Uh, but then as you continue to slide, eventually you will perfectly uh, match up and cover that up with this, and you'll have a maximum positive value at that point. Right, so hopefully that makes sense. You can think about it here as you start sliding in this area, you kind of saturate at full overlap and it doesn't change, doesn't change, doesn't change until you get all the way over here and you start to uh, creep positive again until you're fully overlapped. And then as you continue on, you have less and less overlap and it tends back towards zero. So this shape should make sense to you. Now think about correlating, all right? So uh, now you're going to uh, correlate these two um, uh, signals uh, together. Actually, we're not correlating this anymore. We're, we're just uh, correlating this as we go across, right? But then, um, 
as we uh, get to here, we've got uh, you know summation that gives us this point. Then we reset it and we uh, uh, reset our correlator back to zero and we start correlating again, right? And then we have this one plus this one plus this one plus this one and we end up there, right? Then we reset it to zero and we start correlating and we increase and increase. So now here's the big point that I want you to come away with is that uh, these two receiver techniques don't give you the same result at any arbitrary point in time, right? So if we compare this point in time to this point in time, they have different outputs. But at our sampling instance, these uh, multiples of T sub M uh, or, or capital T, then they have the exact same value, right? So what's important is that uh, both receivers give the exact same result at the sampling instant T, but are different elsewhere, okay? So uh, in the notes, if you download this PowerPoint, uh, in the notes for this slide, there's a reference. I didn't check this reference to see if it still exists. It should. Uh, that's where I got these uh, diagrams from, so I'm giving credit. So you can you can follow that reference. Hopefully that URL is still a valid URL. But um, uh, the, the big point that you want to come away with is that um, you have... Uh, differences in between the sampling instances, but at the sampling instant, this match filter is the same as the correlator, right? This is a correlator, this is a match. And so uh, the correlator requires some circuitry or some mathematics or whatever to dump the integrator output after each sampling. Right, so at this point we sample it, then we gotta reset that accumulator to zero, right? And then we start accumulating the values again. And we, um, uh, we, we climb it, so we measure it there, and then we reset that accumulator to zero, and then we start accumulating again. So, um, you know, you can maybe think through on your own how you might have to implement that in some digital, uh, maybe FPGA or maybe in a software defined radio or, or something like that, right? Um, whereas in the, the match filter, uh, it integration actually goes on forever, right? So this is always going to be convolving or, you know, the integration part of that convolution. So it's pretty subtle, but here we're going from zero to this little t and forever integrating, right? Uh, but then we just sample it at these intervals of cap t. Here, in this case, we're integrating from zero to cap t, so we sample it at this cap t, but then we start all over again, right, at uh, zero, and we we wipe out the accumulator that's implied by this integration here, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And in back to uh, last week's uh, or Tuesday's lecture where we look at how those uh, uh, things are implemented. All right, so, um, Let's look at, we've got 15 minutes here, so let's try to help you prepare for the exam. So uh, go through these different things, right? So, um, you know, I'm trying to, now that you've seen some of these concepts that we started with, and but then we kind of build upon it, we should start to understand things a little bit more, right? So I gave you this equation, maybe in the first lecture, maybe the second lecture, um, and tried to explain it, but 
uh, now I hope that at the end of this uh, MATLAB assignment four, that you are starting to understand that. Maybe we uh, didn't talk about the bandwidth implication. Maybe you could uh, start to understand that a little bit from our um, uh, thing earlier in a lecture about relating EBNO to SNR. But uh, here we've got this signal to noise ratio, right? So if uh, we try to go to a more bandwidth efficient type modulation, right? So we're, um, we're encoding more bits into a single symbol, right? Uh, 64 qualm uh incorporates six bits into a single symbol versus eight psk which is only doing three bits right so the 64 qualm is kind of fundamentally sending three times or i'm, I'm sorry twice the number of bits per symbol that an eight psk or an eight qualm would be right but the distances between those uh, symbol points, those constellation points in a 64 qualm is a lot smaller, right? Assuming that we're dealing with kind of the constant power, right? So if we create that 64 qualm so that its average power is about the same as the PSK, then uh, because we've got a lot more points, those are all going to be crammed closer together. And if you look at those outputs of those plots, uh, those constellation, the noisy constellation plots, uh, you see that it's it's going to be a lot harder, right, to distinguish those points, right? So um, a more bandwidth efficient uh, type of system would have more uh, a higher M or a higher K, right? And uh, but to, uh, you know, it's going to have this impact on your noise immunity or your signal power, right? So kind of look through this and, and understand it again. This is representing an upper bound. Uh, it takes some work to achieve that, and you're only going to be able to approach that. Um, we'll talk about some of the additional techniques we use in error control coding to actually get there, right? But, uh, and this is really the upper bound on the error-free rate, right? So somehow, as uh, long as you've got a certain amount of bandwidth in your channel that you're able to use, a certain amount of uh, signal power relative to the noise power in your receiver and your uh, other noise sources, you ought to be able to achieve a maximum of this capacity, bits per second, error-free with no errors, right? Ultimately. Now, you might get some errors, but you have a means to correct those errors, right? So, um, uh, and we haven't talked about that yet, but we will, right? So, uh, entropy of a random variable, right? So, we uh, should understand this a little bit more a low probability event is surprising and therefore has a high amount of information. I actually think we did pretty well on that question on the first exam, right? A high probability event, well, it's likely to happen, so it's not going to surprise us if it does, right? So we knew it was probably going to happen and therefore it conveys low information, right? So if you work this out, you uh, understand how logarithm behaves and you're looking at the negative of that and taking an expected value because that's a probability there and you're trying to transform that into that. Uh, so uh, here's what should be an easy one, right? So the FSK signals have a maximum rate. We did a, a few slides on this, deriving this. Uh, not going to ask you to derive it, but you ought to be able to recognize this. Be careful that uh, period is the inverse of rate, right? So I could give you a uh, symbol rate, 
and then you would need to identify this equation as the one to use to determine how far apart do these symbols need to be in order for uh, uh, them to not overlap on each other, right? So if you kind of think back, we uh, we noted that there's a, a sync x over x type of behavior and that um, by doing it at this spacing or more, you you line up the the peaks with the nulls of the other symbols and that type of thing, right? So, uh, but the, the point is recognize this formula, understand that rate is the reciprocal of period. So this might be in terms of hertz or uh, symbols per second or something like that, right? Whereas this would be the period of the symbol, right? The number of seconds or milliseconds, microseconds or whatever, right? And just plug in to that equation. So that should be easy if you've looked at it, right? And then our MRE modulation allows us to encode multiple bits per symbol sent. Right, so this is how we get bandwidth efficient modulation, right? But uh, so I've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, using the Q function, right? So we've analyzed this for, we've done a, a probability of error for uh, binary antipodal modulation and one for quadrature. Uh, type modulation and if you look at this uh, thing here this is kind of a unipolar type of thing here right so instead of this being minus a it's zero so this would be what we call on off keen and um that's what uh the term i use ah, try that again let's Go back here. So uh, this uh, is this binary on-off signaling, right? So instead of uh, sending uh, minus A and plus A or uh, J, A, and A, we're sending zero and A, right? So uh, just another uh, implementation of something that uh, is binary and very similar to each other, right? So uh, I give you uh, kind of an explanation of how you can go through here and you can set up your vectors. These are actually vectors here. Uh, S0 is zero and S1 is A times the square root of T. Now this, this uh, square root of t here arises because of deriving the, the basis function for this and uh, making sure the energy works out, right? So you got amplitude and a, um, uh, a time. So if you look here, I kind of explained this. So I said I gave uh, S1 is equal to this in lecture, but how did I find that? So uh, that's basically looking at this equation here and then um, you know saying that energy is going to be the uh, amplitude squared right over time and we integrate from zero to T so this is a, a rectangle from zero to T because we have a constant amplitude and so the energy is this a squared T from that um, you would uh, create a orthonormal basis function that looks like this, right? And so then uh, your vector coefficient would be either zero times this basis function or this a times the square root of t times this basis function, right? And so um, and, and I wouldn't ask you to redo all of that, but I'm uh, explaining that so you can follow uh, the this solution and, and the notes and that uh, then this is our uh, variance or the power spectral density of the, the noise right so um, then you can work through and again the idea is that 
uh, surrounding each of these. This this uh, symbol S zero is at uh, zero, right? So it's at zero. Uh, and so when we plug in this probability for the, the Gaussian noise, we've got a, a mean of zero, right? But here we've got this mean of uh, uh, the location of S1, right? Which uh, we've said is, is this constellation point there, right? And then uh, we just plug in the values for the uh, Gaussian here. Then this you can look through and um, uh, note that there's, uh, uh, if we relate these, uh, so this is deciding in favor of SO if our probability of uh, receiving R given that S0 was sent. This again is our map receiver uh, with equal probable symbols, so there's no bias term here. And decide uh, uh, for S0 if this holds, otherwise decide in favor of S1. So that's kind of written this way. I, I uh, talk about that a little bit in the uh, presentation. So uh, just that's a little bit of uh, notation that you might run across. Uh, it's not necessary to use this notation to solve this, but uh, it's the idea that uh, we're going to kind of divide these and that if it's greater than one, that would mean that this value is greater than this, right? And so then we would decide for S0. If it's less than one, that would mean that this value is larger than this and we would decide for S1. Uh, so we've got um, the, the base is the same. Right, and so we can well right away cancel out the coefficients since the bases are the same, it's just e. Uh, then we can, uh, in this case, it's a division, so we would subtract the coefficients, and uh, so you can kind of verify that well, there's a minus sign there out front, and so uh, we'd have this r squared minus this, there's a minus sign there too, so uh, it's not. Uh, super clear uh, that that's a minus sign. But uh, so we're just combining, doing some algebra at this point. And uh, then you can look at this kind of rationalize through and see, um, uh, you know, knowing the uh, tendency of this exponential uh, e, uh, the natural number e to the minus this coefficient, understand how that uh, behaves, and then uh, you can work out that this R, if it's greater than this threshold, it's S0. And if you think about it, right, so we uh, set a um, this, right? So uh, the, the, the tough part is calculating it to these vectors, right? And now, uh, since they're equal probable, we're going to draw a decision line halfway in between these, right? Which would be uh, A over two times the square root of T, right? So, but that's how it would be derived. Uh, this one, am I running out of time? I'm running out of time. Uh, take a look at this, but uh, 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 I, I'm sorry. Take a look at this one, um, and uh, I don't think I'll I'll ask about that because I didn't get time to uh, discuss this. So don't worry about don't worry about this one for this exam. All right. Um, so again, if you are uh, concerned, try to make an appointment with me. I think if you leave it until Tuesday morning, you've kind of run too late. So uh, try to see me by um, uh, on Monday if you can. Uh, make an appointment, though, when you do that. So um, all right. Other than that, have a great weekend. Take care.